Good morning. Okay, hello, good morning. And uh, last day of Dreamforce, three days of partying behind us. You guys are the true champs for being here at 9.15 a.m. That means you care about security. At Salesforce, we do as well. So welcome to this talk. We're going to be talking about our awesome mobile SDK. And we are going to tell you how the mobile SDK is going to help you prevent some of the top vulnerabilities on mobile apps. My name is Martin Vigo. I'm a senior product security engineer at Salesforce. Uh, I take care of the mobile security. I also do some authentication, identity, and some other clouds that we have uh, at Salesforce. And with me today is Jesse. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jesse Kinzer. I'm also a senior product security engineer here at Salesforce. And I focus on the marketing cloud and app exchange. Awesome. So when we talk mobile, the first thing we got to do is try to differentiate between the native mobile apps hybrid mobile apps and full web mobile apps. And this is important and you will see very soon why. So native mobile apps, as you can imagine, are the ones written in the native OS code. And basically they are way more performant than the, than the uh, hybrid apps, but also they have full access to the, to the phone sensors and capabilities like photos, GPS, things like that, right? On the other hand, we got the full web apps, which is basically apps written in HTML, JavaScript, CSS, that really run in the browser, you just get a wrapper around it. Advantages, you don't need developers specialized in iOS, Windows, Android, Blackberry, I guess, still. I'm not sure about it. And in between is where it sees the hybrid mobile apps. Hybrid mo mobile apps are really cool because it has the advantages of both. So you can have apps written in HTML5 and JavaScript, but you get a JavaScript bridge that allows you access to the full native uh, par capabilities of the, of the mobile device, like accessing to pictures and things like that. So this is important also when it comes to the threat surface. So on the right side, you see vulnerable types of vulnerabilities that affect uh, native mobile apps. We have things like what is the kind of stuff that you store in the, in the app sandbox? Or uh, how do you do network communication? Do you encrypt your traffic or not? Do you enforce it? Crypto, do, do you have any crypto at all? Do you implement crypto the correct and secure way? Uh, things like uh, leaking data through something like the clipboard, for example, when you copy paste from one app to another, who can sniff that stuff? Uh, we have also data leakage. Sometimes it's not very familiar to developers through backups. From the moment you do a backup and it's stored on a different machine, you as a mobile developer lose access and control over that data. So you got to make sure and control what is the kind of data that you are backing up. And then we have things like remote procedure calls, your scheme handlers, if you use custom schemes that are vulnerable to uh, scheme hijacking and things like that. Now, when we talk about hybrid apps, we need to add the vulnerabilities that affect HTML as well. And this is one of the challenges, right? Because our threat surface suddenly expands. So we have to take care of things like cross-site scripting, C-Surf, SQL injection. We need to deal with input validation and all that kind of things. All right, so the OWASP organization is a nonprofit organization that focuses on uh, this improving the security of mobile applications. So they publish out a list of the top 10 most common mobile vulnerabilities. And the latest version was in 2016. So for this talk, we're going to kind of step through each one of those top 10 vulnerabilities, talk about what it is, and then how the SDK can help mitigate some of that risk. <coughs> so the first one up is improper platform usage. So this is really an insecure implementation of some of the native security features within the platform that you're building on. So a common thing that we see here is violation of published guidelines. So an example of that would be the iOS keychain. So Apple recommends that you use the iOS keychain to store any sensitive data. But a lot of times you'll see app developers accidentally use the app's local storage to store this data. And so if an end user does a backup to their local computer, an iTunes backup, that data is then going to be stored unencrypted. So make sure you're using whatever the published guideline is for secure storage. Uh, another thing we see a lot of times is an unintentional misuse. So these platforms are constantly changing, right? Android is always rolling out a new version, same with iOS. So you've got to make sure you stay up to date on the documentation itself. And maybe before, in a previous version, you were implementing a security class, right? But in a new version, maybe something's changed within that class. So how can the mobile SDK help with this? Um, first and foremost, it's open source. So there's always a ton of eyes on the source code itself. Um, we also require that our mobile SDK developers go through a very specific security training program uh, that's tailored for mobile development. And then we also do a code review as part of the Salesforce SDLC program. 
And then in addition to that, we also do a, a bunch of other security reviews. So in-house uh, product security team does a security review. We bring in independent third parties to do a security review of the code. And then we use a variety of different security scanners. And then we have a well-known uh, bug bounty program within the HackerOne platform where we invite some of the elite hackers around the world to come in and try to poke holes in the code. Next up is insecure data storage. So this is really when tr uh, data has, has been left behind in the app. So an example of this may be hard-coded credentials or OAuth tokens right within the app package. Another thing we see is personal data or preferences that are left behind. And then logs. You've got to be mindful of what you're shipping out to logs. And then another thing that's commonly looked over is automatic storage. So a lot of these platforms are very robust. So they may write data out to temp files or cache data automatically. So you've got to be mindful of how that's happening and make sure you account for that. And then leaks. We talked about logs. When you're writing out debug information, make sure there's nothing sensitive. Um, if your app crashes, maybe during a payment process, make sure credit card data isn't exposed in any way. And then analytic services. You've got to think about really what you're shipping out to these third-party analytic services. And then, of course, caching. So unique URLs, requests and responses could contain sensitive data, and then images could be cached. So the mobile SDK here really leaves no trace. So it's going to use the OS-provided secure storage for any secrets. It's going to encrypt sensitive files right within the sandbox. And it's not going to log any sensitive information. It's also going to handle your server side and your client side cache control for you. And then it offers cleanup routines for logged out users. So once a user logs out of your app, you don't have to worry about any data being left behind. Next up is insecure communication. So the real worry here is eavesdropping, right? So you don't want to use HTTP within your app because it could be intercepted at any time. So that means you want to use HTTPS. But then you have to worry about the versions, the Cypher suites, making sure that it's really enforced within your entire application. And then make sure, if you've got a secure app, that you're not calling insecure endpoints within that. And then certificate management is, is always kind of a headache. Uh, you've got to make sure that you're not taking self-signed development certificates um, and accidentally publishing those out to your production. Uh, and then because of the nature of mobile, right, we've also got to take into consideration these other protocols like Bluetooth and NFC. So the SDK can really help you encrypt these communications by default. So it's going to use HTTPS only. It's going to handle the deprecation of these retired and vulnerable Cypher suites. And then it only accepts trusted certificates. Then I'm going to let Martine talk about insecure authentication here. OK, we are at number four of this top 10 list of mobile security threats that we find most common. So insecure authentication. As you know, authentication is about proving that you are who you claim you are. And uh, the type of vulnerabilities that we found related to this field is uh, usually comes to vulnerable APIs, the APIs that our mobile apps use. Usually, well, usually, I take that back. Sometimes we found uh, no authentication in actually sensitive actions or just poor entropy in, in a session like this. For example, that uh, the, the key length is not enough or maybe like this is an exaggeration, but a username is used as a session authentication. Obviously, that's a bad thing. So we also find, and this is very interesting because that's the hacker mindset there, that uh, some hackers, what they try to do is to go to the mobile version of your APIs rather than targeting the web app. Because sometimes what we find is that you have very strong authentication modeling web, but then you kind of relax or you don't pay as much attention, or simply the developers are not equally skilled in the security field that develop mobile. So they will focus on that because you can use a proxy, look at the traffic, and start to... to um, to poke there. And then, password or tokens stored insecurely. Password we probably shouldn't even store at all. And uh, there is just no revocation. What happens if your mobile device gets lost? Who has lost a mobile device here? Come on, don't lie to me. I'm sure like at least 50%. So what happens? Can you Do you have to change your password? How do you log out of your session? Things like that. So how can the mobile SDK help with that? Well, we use open standards like OAuth 2.0 for our authentication. We do not store any password. What we store is access tokens that can be revoked. Um, they are obviously stored uh, securely using the OS provided secure storage. And we also, you, this is all things that you can set up. We have inactivity logout that is very handy because if you lose your device, someone, an attacker has only a life, uh, a short time span in order to be able to exploit it. So let's move on to insufficient cryptography. 
Cryptography is hard, we all know that. This is an example, if you haven't seen this before, it's a very popular image to prove how even using standards makes it difficult to have proper crypto. On the right side, you see a clear text image of the Linux the logo. On the right side, you see a AES encrypted image, the same image encrypted in AES. The problem is it's using ECB mode. And ECB, the property, or in this case, flow that it has, is that the same clear text leads to the same cipher text. Therefore, when you are encrypting pixels that are all white, the output is going to be the same. So we see that for this specific case, that cipher is not the best to use. So there is other ways to mess up, like you don't have proper key length, your IVs are set to null, you're using broken crypto, so things like that, right? So how does the mobile SDK help with that? We use AES CBC, which is recommended. Uh, we use uh, secure keys that are completely randomly generated per installation, so we don't share if I got installed Salesforce tomorrow when you too, I don't have the same encryption keys as you, which is something very important. If not, I will be able to decrypt your keys. We use 256 length keys, and uh, they are generated with the OS provider through the random generator. We also store the keys securely. We even use password-based key derivation functions in order to prevent brute forcing from your PIN code if you decide to set that up. And in addition, we offer a feature that is very cool that I encourage you to check out. We have public documentation on it. It's the Smart Store, which is based on SQL Cypher, which is an uh, encrypted database. So you don't need to know anything about crypto. All you need to do is to know pretty much SQL, and you will have an encrypted database that is completely secure where you can store additional data. All right. Insecure authorization. We talked previously about authentication. Authorization is about that you can do what you are supposed to do, and you cannot do what you are not supposed to do. It's the checks all around that. So, and the types of vulnerabilities that we find here are called the either or indirect, uh, insecure direct object reference. What does that mean? We both have a session in Salesforce, right? And there is some parameter that allows me to update, say, a record. Now, I can try to change that ID that points to the record, and, and, but th that record belongs to someone else, for example, to you. Now, if the check will be only, does this person have an active session, then I will be able to change their data. So we need additional checks, uh, authorization-related checks. Not only if I have an active session, but am I allowed to change the record? No, because it doesn't belong to me. So we find that kind of stuff. So that is very easy to find by hackers by poking with the APIs. So, or that the user role or permission is just transmitted as part of the request. You do a state changing request in a post request, and an extra parameter is role equals read only. So I will change that for admin, and that's it. We've, we've found that. Or just hidden endpoints that we, you can use tools to brute force URLs, and suddenly you, you find the hidden or unauthenticated APIs, or just not documented. Or just that the checks are client side, and I can bypass them with a proxy. Um, so how does the mobile SDK help with this? We have a clear public model for authentication. We do all our permission checks on every single request, and we do them based on the session ID, not on additional parameters. Uh, the checks are done, done server side. This is all public documentation. You can go check on it. But in addition, we cannot claim just because we do all good on our side, we're going to be secure. That's for, as uh, Jesse mentioned, we have in-house reviews. We have third-party independent reviews. We have a back bounty that is very popular. And we also use additional scanners to this detect this kind of issues. So. Poor quality code or poor code quality. So we have all, I'm sure, very, very good developers working with us. But sometimes a good developer is an expert in his field, but we all cannot be experts in everything. So it has maybe a little bit of lack of knowledge on the security aspect of it. So this vulnerability that they put in this top 10 relates more not so much like the top one to the iOS related, to the um, OS related uh, issues, but to the code, the specific things like buffer overflows or uh, format stream vulnerabilities. In one, w in one word, it will be the low level kind of issues that you can find, or things like XSS in web views. So, what I was talking about developers, we see also that they just ignore best practices that are public and recommended by the industry, or that as part of the life cycle, there is just no code review, which is never a good idea. So, 
the SDK. Again, it's open source. Uh, we have a specific security training that we actually are part of it for our developers. So they are not only very good at what they do, but they also expand to the security field. We have code reviews, of course, as part of the software development lifecycle. And again, we have all types of third party security reviews and back bounties. Code tampering. This is an interesting one that made it to that OWASP top 10 because this really, this is tampering basically on the client side with your binary ma uh, memory manipulation and all those things that we usually relate to binaries on the desktop systems, but it, it can apply to the mobile as well. The truth is this, re this re in reality is more for video games to try to cheat, advance in the map, collect coins. And uh, it's, 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 it's very, very scoped, this vulnerability. And the truth is, for the mobile SDK, it's not really applicable because you are welcome to tamper with anything you want because we do everything client, uh, ser sorry, server side, all the checks. So if you manipulate some, some requests or something in the memory, there is really no gain to it because uh, there is no advantage you're going to take out of it. So any request that comes uh, um, modified because you modified something in memory, it's still going to go through the server side checks that we mentioned before. Reverse engineering, this one I love because reverse engineering is about taking your binary, taking it apart, decompiling, decompressing, disassembling, go with your IDA Pro, get the most uh, badass hacker that you got in house and look through it and see what you can find. Truth is the mobile SDK, we are welcome that you guys check it out. That's why we made it, we made it open source. Because in reality, uh, trying to prevent, trying to prevent uh, reverse engineering is a bad practice for a very single reason. It's security through obscurity. We don't want to hide anything. If you want to try to prevent that people look at your binaries, that means you are hiding something that shouldn't be there. Again, you cannot store anything that is secret on the client side. It just doesn't work. So we don't want to practice security through obscurity in the industry. Well, it's well known for discouraging that. So please, please come check it out. It's open source. Again, we have a back bounty. We have I, everything is documented. We actually only use the public APIs. So yeah, this is not something that we really afraid of, reverse engineering. And I think we got to the top 10, which is an interesting one, extraneous functionality. What is this related to? This is at the lower level because it's not very common. It doesn't have much impact, but it's still there. We find, for example, that if you go to the About button in, a, in your web app and click five times, suddenly a secret menu pops up for developers, right? Because they are during the tasting phase. They do that, but they forget to remove it in production. Or we have legit backdoors. Please don't get uh, frustrated by the backdoor word. But sometimes for testing, again, we need to be able to SSH or do things like that. And it's very important to remember to have a very separate uh, stage environment, testing environment from production. So sometimes we find that those are still there. Or you forgot to do the black flags or testing code with secrets on it, or just comments in, in a web view in the HTML, right? So the mobile SDK, again, it's open source, so anyone can call us out on that. Uh, we have a rigorous deployment cycle, different uh, environments to testing. We have a special code that uh, we remove automatically as part of the build, so there is no testing code there. And again, we have third-party security reviews as well, and uh, back bounties. And with that, I'm going to head it to Jesse again for conclusions. All right, so the main takeaway from this presentation is that the mobile SDK can really help offload a lot of the risk that's associated with the OWASP top 10. So keep in mind, it's an open source platform. It has a robust feature set that includes things like secure storage and secure communication. And then it also goes through a very in-depth security review process. So we encourage you to check out the remaining security talks here at Dreamforce. And if you guys have any questions, you can find us over in the Salesforce security booth over in the developer forest. Salesforce security booth is right there. And if you have any questions, if not, thanks for attending early in the morning. Thank you.